That's mostly everyone for now. My name is Ryan Burroughs. I'm the executive director of the American Kratom Association. We are joined this evening by Mac Haddo, our senior fellow on public policy, Bob Durkin, former director of the Office of Dietary, Dietary Supplement Programs, Kurt Bramble, current Utah State Senator, will be joining us, and David Carlucci, senior advisor of external, affair, of external affairs, is on with us as well. We are pleased to have you this evening as Mac Haddo will start the meeting with our Prescription Drug User Fee Act uh, concern, uh, and if the FDA is successful, the impact on the Kratom industry if the Dietary Supplement Listing Act is included with that uh, near uh, successful bill. Mac, I will start this with you. Thank you. So, uh, Ryan, before we get to the mandatory product listing, let me bring people up to date on a couple of things that I think are relevant uh, and to update you. First, uh, we obviously had great news in the addition of both Colorado and Missouri to the Kratom Consumer Protection Act. Uh, that brings us to eight states that have passed the KCPA. We had a little bit of a rocky road in Colorado, uh, rather than a rocky mountain high, uh, where we had to make a compromise that's gonna require some cleanup in the next legislative session. But given the, the uh, challenges that were before us, uh, we came out extraordinarily well there. And so we're looking forward to, uh, to other states now joining us. Michigan, uh, the House of Representatives just passed the KCPA. It's now headed to the Senate. And so there, there's some success that we're also experiencing there. Uh, one thing that, uh, that is a factor as we discuss these issues with new states that are coming on board, you probably will notice that we're not saying a lot, for example, about the, uh, the Michigan uh, success because we're only in the first stage of that in terms of the House approval and now goes to the Senate. And the reason is that we're finding a lot of resistance that gets generated when we publicize these, uh, uh, these successes and it triggers the anti-Kratom, the Kratom danger groups to start to focus on those states. For example, they might focus on Michigan going forward to the Senate to try to raise questions that otherwise would not exist be with their, their disseminating inaccurate information. Uh, and, and in that context, uh, I know that there's been a lot of discussion within the Kratom community about how we should be addressing the outrageous statements that are largely false or so hyperbolized that they're, not, they're beyond recognition of any kind of a factual conclusion about the safety profile of Kratom. Uh, my advice is, and, and, and it's, I know it's not gonna be uh, accepted 100% because I make it with some trepidation, uh, is that we do not engage with these people. Uh, on one level, it would be impossible for any of us to convince a family member who has lost a son or a daughter or a spouse to a, an overdose situation in which they have reason to believe that Kratom was a part of that issue. Uh, and of course, they, many of them arrive at the conclusion erroneously that Kratom was the cause of death. Uh, we know that from a factual basis that there has not been a toxicity level established in any scientific uh, literature or research that would document that there is a, a toxicity level that would cause a death from ingesting pure, unadulterated Kratom. Now, there's no question that uh, the medical examiners are tilting to assessing deaths in which Kratom is detected on a tox screen as a Kratom death because they're encouraged to do so by the FDA. They get lots of disinformation circulated at medical examiner conferences where they're encouraged to do exactly that. Um, and you see uh, in the evidence that comes out, uh, for example, a case in Tennessee, which I think many in the social media community have seen where you have an autopsy where the medical examiner concluded that it was a Kratom death. And yet when you look at the tox screen that was evaluated by NMS Labs, which is the leading forensic toxicology firm in the country that contracts with the majority of the, uh, of the local jurisdictions in doing these assessments, it specifically says on that tox report that the client in this case meaning the medical examiner in that county in Tennessee requested that the full drug panel not be done. And it's because it's a foregone conclusion in their minds that uh, the Kratom was the cause of death. Uh, 
And so my point about how we address the Kratom danger community, and that is not to engage them, not to give them oxygen, not to uh, respond to whatever outrageous things they do or say, because they have a very small group. And the fact that we engage them opens up additional opportunities for them to spread their disinformation or their hate. Uh, and, and by the way, again, you lose a family member, the grief sometimes could overtake reason uh, and you have those, those kinds of circumstances. So my advice for whatever weight you might give it is that we stand down from having conversations with this group. Many of you will remember that when some of the leaders of these Kratom danger groups were on our previous webinars, and maybe they're on tonight with us, I asked them and challenged them to have a reasonable discussion in a webinar where we could talk about the science and talk about the circumstances upon which they uh, wanted to believe that Kratom was the cause of death for their loved one. And none took me up on it. Uh, instead, they just turned the knives on us, called me a murderer, and and said, you know, the fact that we were trying to promote Kratom was somehow uh, promoting this dangerous substance. So there's no winning on, on this score. So I would just give you that advice uh, and hopefully we can, we can reduce the temperature on some of these discussions uh, simply by not giving them the oxygen. Let them say what they're gonna say and do what they're gonna do, but make them work for any recognition of their point of view as they go forward. I think that the, if we're gonna learn any lesson at all, it probably is best illustrated in what happened in Pennsylvania in Radnor Township, where you had a, uh, a Kratom store uh, you know, go into the town and because of a variety of mistakes that were made in terms of getting local zoning, zoning permits in order to proceed with the build out of that store, it enraged the community. And what we've seen is a cascading uh, kind of effect where there isn't anything that the anti-Kratom people won't say in public meetings about Kratom, however incorrect it is. And you have now got a out of control uh, board of commissioners or township, uh, uh, whatever the right term is for those, those people that are elected officials there who are advocating strongly uh, to, uh, to get Pennsylvania to enact a ban. And you now have a member of the state legislature who's going to put in a Kratom ban. Uh, this is what happens where you get this cascading effect. So that's why it's, it's so important that, we, uh, that we, we simply pick our battles. Now, an example of the other side of this where we have to have a fight is happened in Mississippi, where we beat the ban that was proposed. We did it because of the science. Uh, and the, the people in Mississippi are so locked and loaded uh, that they want to ban Kratom, that they now have, through the Mississippi Medical Society, made a recommendation to the American Medical Association that they pass a resolution recommending the banning of Kratom uh, in a scheduling uh, kind of manipulated fashion to do it. So that's another battleground that we are going to fight. I mean, that's not one we'll stand down from. This is based on the science. And I think that uh, we have the opportunity to make a reasoned decision uh, or ask for a reasoned decision based on the science. Uh, as we go forward there. So I'm not saying that we're gonna shirk any kind of fight where it's appropriate to take on our critics. I'm just suggesting that in this very emotionally charged arena where you have uh, these, uh, these family members who have lost a loved one who blame Kratom, uh, I don't think there's any persuading them one way or the other going forward and that we just should stand down from it. So I'll leave it at that, uh, certainly, uh, understand that uh, that what they say is often inflammatory, uh, provocative, and I think that's why we should ignore it. Uh, and and that's that's my advice. Uh, on the current issue that we're uh, really convening here tonight uh, is about mandatory product listing. And as a general characterization, uh, the FDA has enormous powers today to do much of what they're now seeking to do with this new legislation except they want to expand the scope of their authority so that gives them the powers that they currently do not have. And they're not even using the powers that they have right now uh, in order to do what they claim that they want to do because we know that they have a nefarious purpose here. And that purpose is to be able to do what they can't do through the Controlled Substances Act, which is to look at botanical supplements and dietary supplements 
And for those products in that category that they, meaning the FDA, do not like for whatever reason, uh, they want to be able to take them off the marketplace because they can't do it with the science under what they consider to be an overly rigorous criteria that's established, uh, for example, for Kratom uh, in the Controlled Substances Act. So we have today a threat that is posed to not only Kratom, but a number of dietary and botanical supplements that the FDA could, if they're given these powers, have the ability to essentially put those particular products out of business. And it would be a de facto ban on Kratom. And you don't have to look very far for an illustration. Uh, the FDA about a year and a half ago uh, actually went after a, uh, a product called NAC, which has been used for over 30 years. Uh, the FDA put an advisory out. And when that advisory went out, uh, Amazon immediately started pulling all of the NAC products on their Amazon uh, marketplace. And they essentially had a tremendous negative impact on the industry. They removed from the, uh, the ability of consumers to have easy access to NAC products, which they were using uh, for, the, uh, uh, for their health and well-being. And a, a year and a half later, after numerous petitions to them and going to court, the FDA finally admitted that they didn't have a scientific basis to go after that particular product, the NAC products. But what they, what they essentially did, they went after them because they didn't like that product. And that's why this is so important to us to take this battle, to fight on this mandatory product listing. So I'm gonna ask Bob Durkin to kind of describe the specific details about why we need to take this fight. And then I'll come back and talk about what our uh, strategies are going to be and how we can effectively take our fight to the United States Senate and the United States House of Representatives to make sure our voices are heard. So Bob, I'll turn it over to you to kind of give a background from your experience uh, both as an FDA uh, former employee and as an attorney uh, on why this becomes a very problematic issue for us here in the Craven community. Yeah, thanks, Mac. You framed that really well, especially how you used NAC as a recent example of, you know, what could be described as uh, FDA's arbitrary or capricious approach to how they try to enforce dietary supplements. Uh, in the same context, you could talk about CBD. CBD is excluded from the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act in 201FF, the same way that CBD is, but you look at the marketplace for CBD, it's, it's almost as though FDA picks winners or losers based on how they, they, they choose to enforce. Um, they, they deprive the market of NAC through uh, online retailers and other folks that are afraid to market it, but yet they only go after CBD when it makes disease claims. Um, and as Max said, NAC, when, when they finally came around, and I have to be careful, my firm is actually the firm uh, doing the litigation. We're representing the client, the uh, National Products Association, in, in that court case. So I can't say too much. It's an active, you know, court case. But uh, they did come around and finally put out a draft guidance where they're going to allow some enforcement discretion, uh, discretion for NAC. And in that, they said they have no safety concerns about NAC. So why was it a use of agency resources? Why did it happen? What's what's going on there? Um, now I, I use those two examples to frame what we're going to talk about here. There's two distinct things happening right now in the PDUFA, the Prescription Drug User Fee Acts. These are must-pass acts that come up before Congress every five years. And they deal with user fees and how the agency is going to approach products like drugs, biologics, and devices. Um, for some reason, this year, all of a sudden, dietary supplements are thrown in the PDUFA Act, um, the PDUFA bill. Uh, they're, they're calling it the FDA Safety and Landmark Amendments Act. And what they're trying to do is two separate things. The first thing they're trying to do is, is put through a, a mandatory product listing. This would require that before anyone goes to market with a dietary supplement or if they're currently on the market, to send the FDA information about that product. How it does, does fit, you know, how does it fit the definition of a dietary supplement? How's it a dietary ingredient? What's your basis for safety? List the ingredients that are in your product. List the amounts of all the ingredients that are in your product. What's your name, your address? Where is it made? Where is it labeled, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing that they're trying to put through is to make anything that does not meet the definition of a dietary supplement under 201 FF of the act, but is labeled as a dietary supplement put into commerce, that's a violative act under 301 of the act. That's actually criminal. That can actually be criminal. So FDA can make an administrative decision that a product labeled as a dietary supplement isn't a dietary supplement and then say it's a criminal act under 301. This includes things like it, it contains something that's not a dietary ingredient. This would have hit a, a product called Prevagen a few years back. FDA's position was that apple corn wasn't a dietary ingredient. 
Prevagen stayed in the fight. They proved that they were a dietary ingredient. They proved they were safe and FDA left them alone. And I think we all know Prevagen. We all know it's its place in the market. Another place where they, they could say it doesn't meet the definition of a dietary supplement is in the formulation, a unique formulation, something that's swallowed. Maybe it's, it's a new formulation. Um, FDA can say that's, that doesn't meet the definition of a dietary supplement, criminal act violation, prohibited act under 301. Where it gets really scary for Kratom is the same exclusion that prevents CBD or NAC from being in a dietary supplement could apply to Kratom someday eventually. Kratom could be approved as a drug or Kratom could be studied as a drug. If Kratom were studied as a drug, clinical investigations that were approved or acknowledged, allowed, and if there were publications made for it, Kratom would be excluded from the food, from being in a dietary supplement for the same reason that CBD or NAC are. It would not meet the definition of a dietary supplement under 201 and automatically be a prohibited, maybe a criminal act. Um, this, this is dangerous because what it does is it takes away the scientific aspect of FDA. They, they could always go after a product and say it's not safe, but they have to have a basis in science for saying why it's not safe. They have to be able to go in front of a judge if push comes to shove and present their science, why they think the product's not safe, where the, the defendant gets to present their science and say why the product is safe. This removes all that. This, this takes away that burden from the scientific agency and allows them to make an administrative decision that a product is violative and perhaps even criminally on the market. Um, there's no recourse, uh, you know, with CBD, with NAC, um, even recently with some warning letters the FDA sent out some warning letters and some, some articles that they said weren't dietary ingredients. And if you follow that, they originally sent a warning letter to Glambia. Warning letters go out and they, they, they're to the address party about a week before they become public knowledge. So Glambia had that letter for about a week. And it's very likely that when Glambia had that letter, they notified the agency, you've got the wrong people, the wrong Glambia. Despite that, the agency still went out with public messaging a week later and drug Glambia through the mud. It took a trade organization and my law firm to get involved to talk to FDA, to have FDA publicly retract that and apologize to Glambia. It took a trade organization and a law firm to get involved with that. It took a trade organization and a law firm to get involved with NAC. FDA has a history of acting arbitrary and capricious with the authorities they already have. And the PDUFA, the, the Food Safety Landmark and Food Safety and Landmark Amendments Act, is going to give FDA more authority, but relieve, relieve the burden of science, just make it a purely administrative tool. Um, the mandatory product listing, the bill right now has a public-facing component to that, where perhaps citizens can see it. This goes against the Bioterrorism Act where foods, food facilities are supposed to register with the FDA, but the locations are kept secret. You're not supposed to have to tell someone where you make food. If they, they can read your label, they can find it that way, but there's not supposed to be a list made public. The MPL has a public facing list. This is also dangerous because you combine this with the 201 FF, you combine it with um, the, the new draft guidance on NDI and enforcement discretion. And this could be an issue for plaintiff's attorneys, the plaintiff's bar can latch on to this. And just a reminder, there's no preemption from state tort claims acts for dietary supplements. Um, so that's, that's very, very concerning. Uh, the MPL uh, has no carve out for small businesses. They didn't put an economic number on this, but it could cost firms. Um, you know, when you just take the totality of the circumstances, when you look at the recourse that regulated industry would have now, relative to the recourse that reg regulated industry would have when it becomes purely an administrative function for FDA to take your product off the market and maybe make you a criminal. It could have a very chilling effect on the, on the space. And I think it's very easy to see how it would have a, a very detrimental negative, um, maybe unrecoverable unre um, action on, on Kratom, Kratom industry, the Kratom space. Yeah, I think this is this is a great illustration of the very threat that we face here. Uh, part part of what we struggle with is uh, in the kratom community is the fact that we are assaulted at any number of levels by the FDA and by through their uh, dissemination of disinformation. Uh, they get the the medical examiners against this. They they get state public health officials, uh, health departments. They get the, uh, the boards of pharmacy. 
And <clears throat> the FDA does every single thing they can do in order to uh, get these local jurisdictions to go after Kratom. And so there's a fatigue factor here because we're fighting multiple battles across the board uh, in order to maintain the legality of Kratom. There's also on the other side of the equation, the successes we have had, I think have uh, put some people in our community in a position to think, hey, we're gonna win that battle too. And that's not true because the way we win these battles is we engage. And when we engage, we do it with all of the firepower that we can muster in order to make a difference. We, we've seen that happen in state after state. Now we have this national threat. Uh, and, and as we prepare for the submission of the Federal Consumer Protection Act, this is, this is a serious threat to us in advance of that, because you have in the form of Senator Durkin, who is, has been- Durbin, critic, Durbin, Durbin, not I'm sorry. Durkin. <laughs> I'm sorry, Bob, I apologize. The wrong genealogy. When you have Senator Durbin, who has been a long-standing critic of dietary supplements. He hates dietary supplements. And when he introduced this bill uh, in about a month ago, he stood before the Senate and he, and you should go watch it. He literally whined about the fact that he's been this, this advocate for safe products for so many years. And he always got stopped by the late Senator Orrin Hatch. And he always got called names by the people in the dietary supplement committee and or com, uh, community, and did he did everything he could to explain that finally he was released from that. Now he had the freedom that he could go after these dietary supplement and natural products in order to make sure that the FDA would swat them down as he believes they should be. So Senator Durbin, by the way, is wrong because what we need to do is let him know that the very uh, advocacy community that he that has dogged him is still there. It wasn't because Senator Hatch left the Senate or passed away that we suddenly have also gone the same thing. We're there, we're going to speak out, and that's why we need every single Kratom consumer and your friends and everyone who knows the value of Kratom and its benefits in your life stand up for your freedom to continue to have access to safe, unadulterated Kratom products. Senator Durbin wants to strip you of that ability and he wants to use the FDA by granting them extraordinary new powers in order to do that in a nefarious way. That's the bottom line. And so we've got to do everything we can to mobilize our community. In some respects, this is sort of in the weeds, right? We talk about mandatory product listing. You can look in that bill and it doesn't say anything in that bill about Kratom. But what it says is, that the FDA will be able to demand of every product that's manufactured and sold in this country, they have to have a description and a label submitted and presented to the FDA for their review. And it then gives this power of the FDA to not only know what the product is, but where it's sold. Now, does anyone reasonably think that the FDA won't use that, uh, th that information in order to go after the Kratom community? because they can't win on the science issue to get it as a controlled substance any more than they can justify the import alerts that they still have in place uh, against Kratom raw materials coming in from uh, Southeast Asia. So this is a real threat. This is something we have to mobilize and to work on, and we have to do it effectively. We have put out a couple of email campaign advocacy campaigns, and we hope that you will continue to follow those and sign up for them and and tell your story to your elected representatives in the US Congress. These are critically important messages. We have delivered over 14,000 emails from the Kratom community. We need double that or more. And so we're asking you to, to shrug off the fatigue of these battles and say, I'm gonna stand up and I'm gonna fight because this is a real battle and we need your help to do it. And we need to mobilize all of your friends in the Kratom community and your own family members again, that, will, that want to make sure that you will continue to have access to safe and unadulterated creating products. That's our mission as we go forward. So I'm going to turn it to David to describe to you about how you can effectively reach out to your congressional delegation and how you can get your message across, not only with emails, but also in direct contacts, which you can do just by picking up your phone and making that call. So David, I'll turn it to you to give some advice and guidance 
on how members of our community can effectively make the case with these congressional offices. Well, thank you, Mac, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight on this extremely important issue. And it can, like Mac said, get caught up in the weeds, something that you could easily be missed. Um, I spent time working for the House of Representatives. I was a state senator for 10 years. And when I'm talking to other elected officials, I try to keep it at the seventh grade level. I say that because there's so much information coming at them. And what we wanna do is keep it simple. And if you articulate your story, that's gonna be the strongest thing we can do. As Max said, um, when we've been having these state battles, we've been going with our full force and we've been able to tackle the issue, push back against bans and pass the Kratom Consumer Protection Act. Your story, your message is like a missile uh, in the battle to make sure that we keep Kratom legal and safe and accessible. Your story is that, that important energy that'll help us to win this battle. Many lawmakers probably, this is not on their radar. As we all know, there's so many issues going on. Uh, one of the big ones is all of our members of Congress in the House are running for re-election this year. They're in primaries, they're in general elections, so they're busy. Now that's also an opportunity for us. The most important thing to these Congress members is your support and your vote. And so if you ask them, if you pick up the phone and call your Congress member, and say, hey, look, I'd like to have a meeting with the congressperson and their team on this important issue. And you ask them for a date, they will give that to you. It might not be tomorrow, um, it might not be next week, but in the next month uh, or even two, you can get on the calendar and make sure that you have that meeting. And I think that's what's gonna be extremely important, that you introduce yourself to these lawmakers, that they know that you care about Kratom, that it's helped you, and that it has to remain safe and accessible. Um, Mac wrote up, brought up the story about, particularly in Pennsylvania, how we had pushback, uh, particularly from a local community. We're very fortunate that we were able to have legislative support before that, that action ha happened in that local community. And we have a sponsor that's put in the Kratom Consumer Protection Act and is an advocate for Kratom. Uh, luckily, we have that support. We had to educate those lawmakers initially on Kratom. And luckily, they've been educated before these anti-Kratom people have moved in to try to poison the well. So that's why it's so important to get your message out. It's going to be competing with so many other things. You know, lawmakers are, are drinking from a fire hose. So when you do go talk to them, uh, practice your message, right? You, everyone I've talked to, and I'm sure on this line tonight, has a compelling, really amazing story. So, you know, that, that adage, I think it was like Abraham Lincoln or some, one, of our, one of our great presidents said, you know, if I had an hour to chop down a, a tree, I'd spend 50 minutes sharpening the ax. And the idea is that if we have a short meeting, let's spend that time beforehand sharpening our message and making sure that we get across in a concise way what we're trying to say, who we are, how Kratom's helped us, and how this initiative by Senator Durbin um, and the mandatory product uh, listing will be a real problem for all of us. So I, the most important thing is we can all do this, right? I think there's about 100 of us on this call tonight. If we all pick up the phone and call our congressperson's office tomorrow, we will be making a dramatic impact. And of course, maybe some of our meetings will fall on deaf ears, but we will break through. If we keep doing it, we will break through. And you, you never know how your example will influence someone. So it's an important thing to do. You know, we have the scientists, we have lobbyists helping us, but your personal message to your member of Congress is one of the most important things you can do. So I'll leave it with that and happy to answer any questions about that um, and look forward to supporting all of you in this cause. So thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, thank you, David. And, and just to show you that David isn't a sharp millennial like I am, uh, I can tell you that he, what he doesn't know is that there are many, many more people that are on Facebook Live that right. are watching this too. So it's not just 100 people. That's right. But it, That's il right. But it illustrates how important our community is to, to disseminate these messages and repeat it and keep going after it. So as a practical matter, what our objective here is to have our voices heard because there are many other groups that are already joining together with us. And we're gonna organize next week, the, the next hearing 
is going to be on June the 8th before the Senate Appropriations Labor HHS Committee. And that's where they're going to have this discussion. Now, our objective here is to do one of two things. One is to convince the Senate uh, leaders of the appropriations bill that the placement of this highly controversial law onto the PDUF Act, the Pres Prescription Drug User Fee Act, makes it too controversial. And that what they ought to do is strip out this mandatory product listing legislation that Senator Durbin has recommended and make it go to what's called regular order. That means that he has to hold a hearing in the right committee. He has to take public testimony. He has to listen to people. This is an end run, end run against around that process. He's afraid of having that, that voice, your voice heard in regular order. So we've got to convince the Congress that that's the US Senate, that that's the first step. And then secondly, failing that the complete strip of the uh, mandatory product listing, we have to it's, insist on amendments that will essentially defang this provision so that the FDA would have to, would only have authority to remove a product when there's been a final determination made following all of the procedures that are currently in place at the FDA to protect against an arbitrary and capricious action by the FDA. Don't give them more power. Don't give them more regulatory authority. Make them live within their means now and do not allow them the power to take off a product from the marketplace that they do not like because they share the same enmity with dietary supplements at the FDA as Senator Durbin has. And one other thing that will happen if we do this, if we work effectively, we are going to empower a new champion so that Senator Durbin in the future will have to look at the, the, arch, the, the arch champion to Orrin Hatch. He's gonna confront a Senator Mike Lee or some other champion in the United States Senate who will become the conscience of the Senate to stand against the FDA's uh, voracious appetite for new regulatory authority. And we can, we can empower that new champion with this effort by showing that the dietary supplement community is still alive and well, and that we are going to defend the ability that we have to purchase products that are used for health and well being without the interference, the inappropriate interference of the US Food and Drug Administration. Yeah. We've already told you about some of the failures of the FDA, and there have been many, but none of them is greater than their attempt to try to block Kratom and make it a controlled substance under the criteria set by the Controlled Substances Act by taking their disinformation, their lies, and their false statements in order to subvert the system. And it was only this community that stood up and called them into account and made certain that the Department of Health and Human Services and the Drug Enforcement Administration had sufficient information that would show that the FDA was simply wrong on the science. And we can continue to do that. And by the way, all of the new science that's coming out is so, is so much better uh, than we've had in the past, even better than the science that was characterized by the former Assistant Secretary for Health, uh, Brett Chua, when he said in his letter withdrawing the most recent, and that was in August 16th of 2018, withdrawing the scheduling recommendation from consideration by the Drug Enforcement Administration when he said the FDA was wrong on the science. He said that emerging science as of 2018 contradicted the FDA's position. If he were going to write that letter today in 2018, he would write the same language that the expert committee on drug dependence wrote, which is there's insufficient evidence to justify any scheduling of Kratom and there's got to be a lot more science. And all of the science that is funded now by the National Institutes on Drug Abuse is favorable to Kratom. And the reason is, is that this plant helps people. And as Nora Volko said just last week before the Senate Health Committee, Appropriations Committee, when asked directly by Senator Murray of Washington, what is NIH doing in order to counteract this public health crisis of overdose deaths which now got up to a, all, nearly 108,000 Americans that die of an overdose in 2021, Nora Volko, the director of NIDA said, well, one of the harm reduction measures that we think is great is Kratom. Now, how does that contrast against what the FDA say? How does that contrast against the answer that FDA Commissioner Califf gave to Re Re Representative Pocan over on the House side when he was asked by Pocan how he can justify disseminating inaccurate and, and, and untrue information about Kratom. And 
Kayla said, well, we still have all these big concerns about the adverse events, uh, big safety concerns because of adverse events. Well, you know what the next question's going to be that, that uh, the FDA Commissioner Caleb is going to get? Tell us what those adverse events are. Because what, what uh, Commissioner Caleb said was repeating what his policy team is telling him, not the scientists at FDA, what his policy team is telling him because they're anti-Kratom. Now we're gonna make them prove it. And we know that uh, based on the science that we've seen, based on the evidence that's available, that their adverse events are no better than the 44 deaths that they claim were attributable to Kratom back in 2016. And we, we secured all of those autopsy reports and debunked the FDA's position when we did a FOIA, Freedom Information Request Act. We're in the same boat today. We're going to force the FDA to be accountable, but we can't let them use these tactics, these end runs against the, around the formal process that should be a part of the legislative process to fully vet with public hearings and hearing testimony from people who would be adversely impacted by the proposed legislation. That's where we want to be. So your voice needs to be strong. It needs to be loud. And every person that we can recruit to help us, and you're going to be getting more emails in the next couple of days from the AKA, which will further direct you to not only send uh, emails and sign petitions, but also to make those phone calls, as David described, that will be so critical in letting and alerting the, uh, the members of the uh, Senate and the House how critical this issue is to the dietary supplement and botanical supplement uh, community and consumers. So uh, we'll, we'll stop there. I'll turn it back to, uh, to Ryan. I know we've got some questions and answers. We can filter those and figure out uh, what answers we want to provide right now. So Ryan, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, there, there's a few, Mac. I, I, think, um, I think you've answered most of them, but <clears throat> could the FDA refuse to approve Kratom as a supplement or food in order to buy time to research it as a drug? Uh, or wait until a company submits a Kratom-derived drug for approval. That way it can approve Kratom as a drug and then force it off the food and supplement market. How can we get Kratom approved as a food or supplement if this is its plan? So I'll, tell, I'll, ask, I'll ask Bob to answer yeah. that question. Absolutely, that's exactly. And I'll tell you what, the RFP that they went out for, for a, a dose ranging study, uh, a few years, not about a year and a half ago. Um, part of that RFP required whoever did the research to file an IND and uh, that the data would then belong to FDA. Um, so basically right there, you have two of the three elements that would be required to exclude Kratom from the definition of a dietary supplement, just like CBD or NAC was. Um, all FDA would have to do is publish the data. And the, the kicker is it's actually the date that the, the research was approved or allowed. Um, which just makes, basically means the date that the IND was filed, 30 days after the IND was filed. So um, that was probably part of the reason why they went out with the RFP. Uh, a lot of that data that, that the dose ranging study would have derived is, is probably already available, even in the public domain. So it, it seemed like it was a, almost a blatant attempt to, uh, to maneuver so Kratom, whatever article was studied under that, that RFP, would have been excluded from the definition of a dietary supplement. Now, just to show you why this would be so dangerous right now, that means that that's, that Kratom that was studied would not fit the definition of a dietary supplement under 201 FF. The legislation right now proposes to make that a prohibited, maybe criminal act. So based just on an administrative determination, what, what's the date? That's all that has to happen. That's all that happened with NAC. That's all that's happening with CBD. What's the date of the NDA or the date that the, the clinical studies were approved? That's all FDA would have to determine. Say they're not aware that Kratom was on the market as a food or, or diet in a, as a food or in a dietary supplement before that date, and administratively make putting Kratom on the market a criminal act. It relieves removes all the burden of science from the agency. To do this otherwise, the agency would have to show that the product's adulterated. They'd have to be willing to stand in front of a judge with their science and show that Kratom is an unreasonable risk of illness or injury. And someone else, the owner of that Kratom, could stand in front of the same judge with their own experts and say, it's not. Here's my science. What this legislation right now does, it removes that. It makes it a purely administrative function for FDA to exclude Kratom once an IND is filed or once it doesn't fit the definition of a dietary supplement under 201 FF. 
So, so there, there's the encapsulation of the challenge we face that the FDA is going to use every trick in the book that they can muster up and we've got to counter it in every way that we can. And so uh, the issue about what's happening right now within the FDA's province, where there are studies that are being conducted, not only by the FDA, and by the way, that's that human dosing study is on, well, not on hold, it's been delayed significantly, which is great. Um, and internally, they've, they've admitted within HHS that they're struggling with being able to move forward with that study. Uh, Dr. Califf himself uh, has stated that he would never have signed that uh, RFP in the way that it's constructed, where the FDA has the ability to keep the results secret if they don't like them. Uh, and so we might have some help from uh, Commissioner Califf when that study finally is undertaken. But then you have private companies that are looking to take the NDA route, which poses a threat as we move forward here. And so we're going to be working hard to to make sure that we put on the record the fact that Kratom is on the marketplace and it's recognized in a number of ways in order to protect the marketplace going forward. These are, these are complex issues that we have to deal with on a regular basis to guard against the FDA exploiting what are otherwise uh, routine kinds of activities within a marketplace where you see a substance like Kratom that if it's chemically synthesized can become a new drug application. Uh, and of course, the disincentive for using the natural plant and it's the alkaloids in their natural form is that no pharma company is going to do that as long as the plant itself is legal. Because, and that's, of course, an, an interesting point that the FDA takes to heart. Well, let's ban the plant and then we can get people interested in actually doing a, uh, a, a synthesized version or a, a NDA version of the plant itself which would then fulfill in the FDA's view what NIDA is trying to do, which is to preserve the accessibility of this plant for those people that are struggling as a harm reduction measure against opioid addictions where Kratom can help them. So these issues require us to be vigilant as we go forward. And that's why we're stressing so hard that we need your help today. We've been through multiple battles. We have won most of those battles and the ones that are currently in play we're continuing to fight. Uh, and, and I think that uh, when you look at the results, there hasn't been a state that has banned Kratom since 2016 or 17 when the last state did it after the FDA's strong admonition that all the states ban it. And we continue to win on the science, but that hasn't stopped the FDA from their aggressive countermeasures in order to get Kratom into a position where it's not accessible to the public. And that's evidenced by this mandatory product listing initiative that they support and that uh, Senator Durbin is advocating for along the way. So we need your help on mandatory product listing, and we're going to continue to need your help as we push forward with a pro creative message and supporting the science and making the FDA accountable for the science that's there rather than their own bias within their policy group yep. against Kratom. And that's the bottom line. So uh, I think that's uh, uh, the end point, uh, Ryan, are there any other questions? And, but let me, let me also uh, make a point that I think we have overlooked. Uh, Ryan's relatively new to our team. Uh, he's doing a magnificent job. Uh, he's just on the back end of a COVID diagnosis. And so I know he's struggling health-wise a little bit, but through it all, he's been there with us shoulder to shoulder fighting this battle. Uh, and so I wanted to recognize him and I wanted to introduce him to this community because he's been a magnificent warrior that's taken on a big job in order to help manage and marshal the, our efforts here uh, on a national level and at the state level with protecting Kratom's legality. So Ryan, thank you. And, and, uh, and I, I just want everybody in the community to know who you are and what you're doing here. Well, thank you, Mac. I always appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, and, and we do have, uh, I, I believe we answered Kendall Clark's question. Um, the, the, the bill doesn't mention Kratom, so when we talk to our officials, how do we make the connection from the bill and our Kratom story, explain to them how this is a ploy to ban Kratom, uh, might be a good one for David if he's on. There you are, David, sorry. Well, yes, I'm here, and um, it's really what Mac and Bob had talked about in terms of the mandatory product listing, that this is going to be a chokehold. Uh, on Kratom products in a way that the FDA can uh, use now authority that 
uh, they don't have to really block uh, Kratom products. Um, maybe, Bob, do you want to uh, fill that in in, in, a, in a layman's term of, um, you know, how we can articulate that message as best as possible? You know, I, I think a good way to, to articulate it is that, you know, the the laws that are set for the regulation of dietary supp supplements were meant to ensure consumers had access to dietary supplements. There wasn't supposed to be a pre-market approval. Um, the, the onus was supposed to be on FDA to show that they're not safe. Uh, this, this undoes all of that. This, this creates almost a pre-market approval process um, where if FDA doesn't list a product, if FDA doesn't accept a, a mandatory product listing from someone, um, Will that be a de facto exclusion from the market? Will, will Amazon and other retailers, will plaintiffs' attorneys point to the fact that a product isn't listed and use that uh, to, their, to their, their advantage when suing a legitimate company? Um, there's nothing in the proposed legislation that prevents FDA from being arbitrary and capricious about accepting a listing. And you just can imagine where they're going to go with that. So it, it sort of reverses the paradigm. I mean, the deal was no pre-market approval for dietary supplements. This is pretty much a de facto pre-market approval. And then it even goes a little bit further where it, it puts FDA in a position to exert itself and call products criminally on the market through just administrative actions rather than a scientific determination. And I think David said it earlier, right on point, seventh grade level, <laughs> this is a simple message. You are giving the FDA power to do things that they would otherwise do based on their bias against, and it's a well-known bias against dietary supplements, including Kratom. They will take this power and they will destroy the marketplace and eliminate Kratom and other valuable dietary supplements because that's what the FDA's bias has been for three decades. And we just, that's why the Shea was passed in the first place. This is the biggest assault and the biggest threat to Deche since it was passed in 1994, because it essentially, as Bob said, shifts the paradigm where the FDA had to, to justify and prove its case before. Now they don't have to, it's, 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 they shift the burden of proof and they will take us out and we need to stop them. What, what makes it even well. harder is the, the way it's written now, it may not be considered a final agency action when they do it. The only way we were ever able to take FDA to court for the, what their position on NAC, we caught them taking a final agency action on it when they didn't intend to. Then you can sue them. Once they take a final agency actions, when you can, you can sue them, you can exhaust your administrative remedies and then take them to court. They don't go to final agency actions. They just force the market in certain directions from their bully pulpit. And then you, you can't, you have no recourse. You can't exhaust your administrative remedies. Even if you did, you can't take them to federal court then because they never took a final agency action. If this is done in a way where the agency can do this and say something violates 301, without taking a final agency action, the only recourse is to work with FDA. And they've shown with the way they've handled CBD, they've shown with the way they've handled NAC, they've shown with the way they act with those recent warning letters with Glambia getting wrapped up in it. They only react when they have to, when you can force them. And you can't do that usually unless you have a final agency action. And none of this legislation seems to point that FDA saying something is, is a prohibited act under 301 is a final agency action. So in, in the simplest terms, we could say uh, to lawmakers that this, the mandatory product listing will chokehold products that are helping people and be an undue burden to, with little uh, protections for the public, um, that it's not a safeguard for the public, and it's going to be choking out these products that are getting help. And I think you can even keep it as simple as that. Um, obviously, you know, you can go into the detail. Um, but to let them know that, hey, this product that you're using is in jeopardy, and this isn't about protecting consumers. Uh, this is just getting into the red tape of the FDA and preventing people from accessing products that are helping them. And I think it's an important point for us to, to consider that one of the things that we've been trying to do over the past four years is to get the Kratom discussion into the mainstream, not to, not to have Kratom considered to be this weird plant uh, that you know, a fringe group of people use. We know that there are millions of Americans who use Kratom. We know that it's benefiting them and that we are now in the mainstream because in this battle, we are with the dietary supplement community that numbers in the millions of people as well. 
We're in with a lot of other groups that want to have the FDA reined in, not see an expansion of their powers. And so we're going to be a part of that community and it expands our influence with them and makes us more mainstream. So this is a great opportunity for us to raise our voices along with others who are similarly impacted by this overreach of power by the FDA led by Senator Durbin, who's going to continue his anti-dietary supplement and botanical supplement battle as long as he's in the Senate. We just need to restrain him. And we need to, as I said earlier, empower that new advocate that will, our champion, uh, that will join Representative Pocan in the House. We have a Senate champion in, in embryo right now and bring them to the, the table here to start the, to finish these battles so that we're protected against these kinds of overreaches by the FDA. Uh, these are these are the kinds of opportunities that we have to rise up to, that we have to take advantage of, and that we have to respond to. Uh, the threat is real. Uh, the opportunity is present for us. And we need everyone to redouble the efforts that they've made uh, to date and make sure that your voices are heard loudly in the halls of the U.S. Congress. And you'll have those opportunities over the next couple of weeks. And we can do what we did with the WHO. We can do what we did in 2018 with the second um, the science battle over whether or not Kratom should be scheduled. And as we did in 2016, just a replication of that effort and that intensity in that battle. And it's going to make a huge difference in order for us to push this across the finish line to protect the Kratom community as best we can. And, and we're at the AK side, we're standing ready to fight. Uh, we just need your assistance now to join us in making sure that uh, that we accomplish this objective. So thanks to every one of you for once again, rising up and being willing to, uh, to engage the battle. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, I, I think out of a respect of time, we've, we've answered most of these questions. I have just put my email in the chat. Please, please email me directly and I can field these out if I need to. Uh, but otherwise, um, Really, we, we've, we've had a tremendous 